Welcome everyone to part two of accessibility and compliance, where I'm going to be covering how to measure digital accessibility. Um, as Laura said, I am Glenda the Good Witch, um, and I um, love introducing myself as that because uh, it's it's quite memorable. And I am the lead accessibility expert here at DeQ. I've been working in the field for over 20 years. Because we may have a variety of people attending this seminar today, uh, we're going to start out with the basics of what is accessibility, but we'll fly through this portion. So what is accessibility? The definition that I got years ago that I love the most comes from nobility. Accessibility, when all people, regardless of disability, can obtain the same information and perform the same functions. It's really simple to understand it from that perspective. And as a foundation to where we're about to go in this hour, if you understand accessibility from that perspective, it's also important that you understand what a disability is. And it really boils down to five major disability types related to vision, hearing, motor, speech, and cognitive. We could spend an hour on each one of these individual official disabilities, but today we're really focused on how do we measure digital accessibility within this situation of compliance, a very legal perspective. And for years and years, the answer to that question has been WCAG 2.0 a and double A. It is the international standard for digital accessibility. There's a new wrinkle in that. We will cover some of the WCAG 2.1 as well, and I'll give you a taste of where that's already in place. But for years, the international standard for measuring digital accessibility for compliance, WCAG 2.0, A and double A. Very clear. So, what is WCAG? Um, if you haven't heard that phrase before, or if you have, Web Content Accessibility Guidelines is what WCAG stands for. But I want you to, in your mind, scratch out the word web content and replace that with digital. Because when WCAG was written at the W3C, it was written to be technology agnostic. It is not meant for just the web. It does not just apply to the web. It applies to anything digital. That includes native mobile, that includes PDF. So don't be um, confused by the name. Very important to also realize that there are three levels of compliance and they are known as A, double A, and triple A. From a compliance standpoint, I have never seen anybody choose AAA as their conformance level for legal compliance. And within the W3C documentation, it is even specifically said that it is not recommended to go to AAA for an entire site because it's literally impossible to satisfy all the AAA criteria. There are great things in there, there's wonderful best practices, but from a compliance or legal standpoint, uh, you're going to see A and AA as the standard. A is the lowest level. And when I explain it and we look at what's in A level, it removes major barriers for people that are blind, deaf, and have some motor disabilities and or have motor disabilities. When we move into the double A level, we're going to see some major barriers being removed for low vision and a little bit of help for cognitive. So for anybody new to WCAG or new to the levels, don't think that going to level A is enough that double A really has major barriers for people with different disability types like low vision and cognitive. Then the important question, if I say WCAG is the digital standard to use, what version should you use? Let me be crystal clear. Do not use WCAG 1.0 that was published in 1998. It was superseded by 2.0. Don't use that version. It's old, it's outdated, it's deprecated. WCAG 2.0, which was published in 2008, 
um, might have actually been 10 years ago today. Um, a very valid standard. It has 38 requirements at the A and AA level. You can use it now. You can use it going forward. This is a valid standard. And WCAG 2.1, which was published this year in June, has a total of 50 success criteria or requirements at A and AA. Note that it includes every single piece of WCAG 2.0 verbatim word for word. So 2.1 did not throw 2.0 out. It is still there and valid. And then it adds 12 new requirements at the A and AA level. If you're in the United States or many other countries, WCAG 2.0 is an obvious now. You should already be compliant. If you're in Europe, Europe is ahead of the game and is already pointing in some of their legislation to WCAG 2.1 for compliance as early as 2019. So if you're in Europe, already include those 12. And if you're smart, already include those 12 as soon as you can, even if you're in the US or Canada or Asia or Australia, because those 12 new requirements um, remove additional barriers. We've already seen one US settlement that invokes WCAG 2.1. Do I think the legal landscape in uh, North America is gonna change to WCAG 2.1 this year? No. Um, but you can be prepared by going ahead and picking that up. So let's take a look at WCAG 2.0 and 2.1 from a high level as we think about this as a compliance measure. It's really important to understand that this makes a good compliance measure because it is objective. And as we look at WCAG 2.0 and 2.1 structure, there's something very important to realize. At the top level are principles. At the level right down from that are guidelines. And at the third level deep are the success criterion, the actual requirements. Many people don't know that the principles and the guidelines are merely a conceptual framework that are not objectively testable. So when we're looking for a legal understanding of am I compliant or not, be careful about what you're reading in 2.0 and 2.1 and make sure that you're focused on the success criterion for a measurement perspective. Those are written in such a way that they can be objectively tested. Very important distinction. If we look at WCAG 2.0 and 2.1, this conceptual framework of the principles, not objectively testable, maps out to POUR, the word P-O-U-R, standing for perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. From a human perspective, memorizing 38 different requirements, understanding how they relate to human beings is hard to keep in our head. Whereas this concept of perceivable, can the information even get into a person's mind? Operable, can it be used by a person with a disability? Understandable, is it possible for them to understand and operate it? and robust, will it work in the future, is wonderful guidance from a human understanding. But remember, this is not something we can pull out as objectively testable because it's just not defined enough. At the next step down, we have the guidelines themselves. And I'm not gonna read all these guidelines to you. I'm gonna pick one in the perceivable and Let's look at 1.2, time-based media. It says provide alternatives for time-based media. Well, that's almost objectively measurable, but not quite. So again, we're here at a concept 
And it's not until we get down to the next level where the numbers are number dot number dot number do we get to something that is actually measurable. So here I have them all on screen in WCAG 2.0 and 2.1, this example of captions for pre-recorded media is the actual requirement. Captions pre-recorded provided for all pre-recorded audio content in synchronized media, except when the media is a media alternative for text and is clearly labeled as such. That's the thing you can measure. Perceivable, provide alternatives for time-based media, still a little mushy, get down to the SC, the success criterion, that's the requirement, objectively testable. So when we're trying to measure something, we have to be able to measure it reliably, repeatedly, multiple people. That's why this is so important, looking at it from a legal perspective. If we were to spend an afternoon together, we might be able to go through all 38 success criteria, but that's not the point of this presentation. In WCAG 2.0, A and AA, I want to let you know out of those 38 success criteria, 14 of them are in the category of perceivable, 12 in operable, 10 in understandable, and 2 in robust. That's how they fall out. Now remember WCAG 2.1 is the newer of the two and it's adding 12 new success criteria and see how they fall, six in perceivable, five in operable, zero in added to understandable, and only one added to robust. So these 12 new success criteria are great to be picking up now. I'll tell you I have clients right now that are proactively picking them up. Uh, they're in design phases and they wanna make sure that they do it before they launch their next design. So definitely something I recommend to do uh, as soon as you can. So with that landscape of WCAG 2.0 and 2.1, A and AA in place, that's your objective measure. What are some easy first steps that you can take? And then we'll get into some of the harder parts of the interpretation. So easy first steps. If you're brand new to this field, um, and you're like, well, how do I even get started? Three first steps, keyboard, form labels, and automated testing, I can teach anyone how to do. So let's start with keyboard. What if you cannot use your hands enough to comfortably type on a keyboard or more importantly, the dexterity required for a mouse. This is a picture of my dear friend Jean Rogers and I at an event in Austin and Jean's hands uh, do not let him use a mouse as easily as you and I. And so you can test for accessibility for a person with a hand disability by literally throwing your mouse in your drawer, refusing to touch your touchpad, and just using keyboard alone. You don't have to figure out how to use all the interesting assistive technology that a person with a motor disability might use. Just make sure that it works by keyboard alone and you will have passed a significant requirement for people with motor disabilities. For form labels, this is an important piece that you can test and learn quickly. If I take you to a screen where, for example, you were getting ready to look at used cars to make a purchase for someone in your family, maybe that unexpected wonderful Christmas present of a new car in the driveway on Christmas morning. If you were a screen reader user who couldn't see the screen, and you came to this page with your voiceover screen reader, which is what I have displayed. If the form fields aren't labeled, for example, I'm looking at the screen and it says narrow matches by search all cars by make and model or keyword. And I can see over in the left where 
voiceover is listing the form controls that that one's clearly labeled. It says search all cars by make, model, or keyword edit text. Ooh, but it actually didn't include narrow matches by. And then we get down into the hard stuff where it just says button, combo box, 78745 edit text, go button, combo box, combo box. This is because the code has not labeled each one of the form fields. We take a dive one step deeper into that. If you're a programmer or comfortable in HTML and you see a form that's asking for biographical information of yourself, first name, last name, for example, and if we just focus on the first name field, the text to the left of the form field, first name with an asterisk by it, that's the label. It tells a person who can see that this text box is expecting my first name. The input field itself, input type equals text, is where I'll be typing. And there's an ability to use the for attribute and the ID attribute to programmatically link those together. So if you're a geek and you wanted to know what's under the hood to make this work, this is one of the technical solutions. If you're not a geek and you're just trying to figure out form labels, like Glenn, I understood the keyboard thing, but I don't understand this. Don't worry because we have an easy automated test that can help you find errors like this that are very obvious. And I'm going to highlight for you a free open source extension. Remember, these are just the first three simple steps you can do. And have you run accessibility testing automatedly in your browser, getting a description of the problem, the exact line of code causing the problem, and an explanation of how to fix it. So you could download this, install this in your browser today, and get some steps forward in accessibility. So it's a wonderful free open source gift uh, that I encourage everyone to get installed. So if we know that WCAG is our digital measure objective for compliance, and we have three simple options of seeing if we're compliant by keyboard alone testing or running acts to see things like form labels or missing alt attributes. Well, certainly the question may come to mind, is all of WCAG this easy? Um, without a doubt, I will say no. Accessibility is not all that easy. There are pieces of WCAG measurement that are that easy. And I wanted to give you some of those so that you could go do something productive right away. But in my 20 years of experience, I've seen so many different interpretations that I jokingly call it 50 shades of accessibility. And this is a problem that I'm not real happy about because we spend far too much time as an accessibility community arguing over whether something is accessible or not. And a dear colleague, Wilco Fears and I, have written a white paper about this specifically. And I'm gonna share some insight with you that we came to a conclusion based on this Accessibility Wars white paper, rethinking the industry-wide interpretation differences. And I encourage you to read this in full uh, but if you want the condensed version, you're about to get it uh, available at bit.ly A11Y piece for the entire white paper. So as Wilco and I have experienced within DeQ many interpretation differences of WCAG, as we're writing this paper, we realize that there are four major causes. One is the web content accessibility guidelines and the field of accessibility are complex. So interpretation differences arise from the fact that we're dealing with something very complex. There's also a huge, 
huge volume of WCAG documentation, which makes it difficult for any one individual to not only understand, but maybe to even have read some of the documentation. When WCAG 2.0 was published, it was published smartly in a way to be agnostic, technology agnostic, not just based on HTML. That makes it last longer, um, have a, a broader reach, but because it is technology agnostic, it leads to more challenges of interpretation. And the fourth piece that we discovered is motivation for testing can change how you interpret something. So, taking this forward, a key piece that we discovered in the interpretation differences comes from these two words, normative versus informative. I remember in my accessibility career the day a colleague said normative to me and I didn't know what the word was. And I thought they were just using highfalutin language. So if you, like me, at that point, were not very used to the word normative versus informative, I'm going to show you the definition in just a moment. Normative is a word that you're going to see in WCAG 2.0 in a really small place. So if I show you the 2.0 guidelines, which I have a picture of the top part of the screen on the left, and I show you the sufficient techniques for WCAG 2.0, and I asked you where the word normative appears, it's right under the words WCAG 2.0 guidelines. I'm going to magnify right under WCAG 2.0 guidelines. If you go look right now out on the web, you're going to see in small print, this section is normative, and it's a link that goes down to the glossary. Hmm, this may be important. It's hard to catch. You may never have seen this line before, but it's really important because normative means it's required for conformance. And did you know that informative means not required? So that's a big deal. Because before somebody pointed out that line to me, which I had not read for many a year of being in the field, I didn't realize a huge chunk of what's written out of the W3C is informative, not required. This is a huge source of our conflicts. So let's do a little mental poll. We're not going to do the poll online. You're just going to say to yourself, out of these things, which do you think are normative, in other words, required, and objectively testable, or informative? Principles of WCAG 2.0, guidelines, success criteria, the conformance section, the glossary, the understanding documents for WCAG 2.0, and the techniques for WCAG 2.0. So mentally, mark in your head which ones you think are objective, testable, required. Here comes the answer. The only pieces that are published at the W3C that are required are the success criteria themselves, a conformance section within WCAG 2.0, and the glossary. Anything that you're seeing in the understanding documents is informative. And here's like the big surprise for many. All those sufficient techniques, they're not requirements. They're ways of sufficiently meeting, but they themselves are not requirements. They aren't informative. And be cautious. The principles and guidelines themselves, while they're in the normative section, they are not objectively testable. W3C says this, they're not objectively testable. So that right there is one of the most important things I can share about reaching 
consensus on interpretation. Now, it's not the only thing that I have to share because who is using the requirements and why they are using the requirements also has a major impact on interpretation of is this accessible or not. Why do I know this is true? Looking at the work that the W3C has been doing for future guidelines, the Silver Task Force has done a great job of recognizing that there are many roles, different kinds of people that use the guidelines. You may be consulting on the guidelines. You may be making policy. You may be using policy. You may even have a disability and benefit from the standard itself. Maybe you're teaching it, researching it, measuring, testing for it. All of these are different roles. And instead of looking at all of those roles, let's just focus on a few so that I can drive home the concept of how much a different role can affect your interpretation of a requirement. Let's think about an accessibility researcher or an accessibility trainer, maybe a digital designer and a developer, and an accessibility tester. And in the tester category, I'm gonna have you think about proactive testing where they're at the beginning of the design process versus reactive testing post-production or, you know, 10 p.m. before the thing's supposed to go live at midnight. So how do these roles impact how you would interpret your accessibility requirements? Well, let's also think about your goal for accessibility as a spectrum. Maybe your goal is, I really don't care about accessibility. I'm gonna bet that the 200 people here are not in that situation, um, but some people may be just at the stage of awareness or grudgingly going towards some compliance, or maybe we're just trying to get to minimum compliance because that's expensive and time consuming. Maybe you have the joy of wanting to go to optimal, where you're not just hitting the dead minimum, but you're also being able to improve the user experience. And then the top level of ideal, inventing a better future. So if these are the goal spectrums for accessibility, and then we map that into those five roles, that aren't even all the roles, but some of the roles. A researcher is going to tend to lean towards creating the ideal, creating a better future, an accessibility researcher. And at the very least, go to optimal. It could be argued that they might be researching something at minimal compliance, but they're gonna have a tendency to lean towards that ideal. And Think if this rings true to you from a training perspective. As a trainer, do you want to teach people how to just meet in the lowest possible way a requirement? Or do you actually want to teach them how to create excellent accessibility design? So they have a tendency to lean towards optimal, but you'll find them across the spectrum of minimum to ideal. Designers and developers, it depends. They may be in a situation where they have no awareness or they're at the beginning or they don't even have enough time to do all compliance. So they're just at some and that exciting moment when they bridge into optimal and ideal. What's fascinating, though, is that testers, I find, who are trying to get something approved to be released will have a little bit more leaning towards minimum compliance if we're close to a deadline versus a tester who's in the design phase that might still be hoping for optimal. So very different motivators based on your role. 
This led to the accessibility interpretation model in the Accessibility Wars paper. And we actually also think of it as the accessibility peace model because we need to stop spending so much time arguing about whether something is accessible or not. And it came down to this concept that when Wilco Fears said this to me, it was a good thing that I had an alcoholic beverage in hand because he said to me, Glenda, there is no correct interpretation of WCAG 2.0 or WCAG 2.1. Why you test influences how you test. And that's what led to us writing this paper because I had a very negative reaction to him saying to me, there's no correct interpretation of WCAG. From a compliance standpoint, I was like, no, Wilco, there is a correct way. And he said, but Glenda, let's write this paper. And this is where we came to the peace model. If we recognize that there are three viewpoints of accessibility interpretations, that we may have a, an organization, a client, we ourselves may be sitting in a situation where minimal compliance is something we're trying to get to. It's a reasonable business decision for an organization to say, we're going to go for the minimum first. In the minimal view, content is only failing if it can be proven without a doubt based on the normative text of the accessible guidelines, WCAG 2.0 in this case. The center line for optimized is when interpretations are based on the intent of the success criteria. This is the space those of us who are accessibility advocates love to be at. It's the smart use of accessibility for good, creating good design, not just sliding by at the absolute minimum. And then thank goodness for those who take on the idealized, where they're not even looking at what's currently possible, but going forward, looking at creating a better future, maximizing and creating new opportunities. I remember when I got started in this field, I couldn't imagine a touch screen being accessible to a person with a visual disability. How could they know? How could they interact with that touch screen device? Apple, working in the idealized zone, said, oh yeah, we're gonna invent a way and created gestures. So those are the three viewpoints that really can lead us to accessibility peace. So let's try using this model on one of the gray areas of WCAG 2.0 or 2.1 and think about it in the accessibility peace model and see if we can find some consensus. So a classic gray area in WCAG 2.0 is 1.1.1 non-text content. And why is that a gray area? If we look at the words, I'll tell you exactly where it comes in. All non-text content that is presented to the user has a text alternative that what? Serves the equivalent purpose. How do we measure that the text alternative is serving the equivalent purpose of a non-text, for example, image. A little bit harder, not as black and white, a little bit more gray. So how do I explain this when we're trying to get consistency and accuracy and measure compliance? Equivalent alt text from a minimum reasonable perspective Replace every image with the alt text, still have access to all the meaningful information in those images. Is that true? And imagine if you were blind, colorblind, or had low vision. Would you have access to the information you needed to make a decision to purchase or to do your research or to do your job? This is reasonable. We could argue till the end of time about, well, I bet I could write better alt than you. But if we bring it down to this reasonable minimal, do I have access to what's meaningful? And can I make the decision? Can I do the work? That's where we come to.
Let's do an example based on a blouse I happen to own. So here's a blouse that I happen to buy off the internet. Um, it's got the cold shoulder thing, it's got a description, and if we look at the screenshot, there are one, two, three, four, five images in thumbnail, and one of those thumbnails is larger, plus it has the color print over on the left in a little circle. Those are the images, the major images on the screen. There's a couple other for social media as well, but let's focus on um, the blouse images itself. What images need alt text in this example? Well, if I were advising someone, one of the games that I like to play, mental exercises I like to play, is what if none of the images have alt text? So I have a screenshot of the same screen, imagining we couldn't see the images and had no alt text, and all it says is split tie sleeve top. And some pricing and some sizing. Feeling pretty uncomfortable about none of the images having alt text especially if I were in a courtroom trying to defend why I said it was okay, which I would never have said that was okay. But I love to put myself in this moment where you're having to defend what you've done for accessibility and you're standing in front of a judge in a court of law. Um, it'll help you make good decisions. <laughs> So what I would find acceptable alt text is product name paired with second product. And in this case, um, it might be the split tie sleeve top paired with blue jeans or white pants or whatever. And you could do this dynamically. So that's acceptable option A. Acceptable option B would be the product name, and instead of pairing it with the dynamic name of the product, you could hand write it out. That would be accessible too. The split tie sleeve top paired with blue jean shorts where you've actually written it out, that would be acceptable. Now, let me show you a real risky one. Don't know if you caught it, but on the first screen, the item number for this blouse is KK2L17. Okay, that could be argued that it was alternative text, and it is unique to that blouse, KK2LI7 or 17. Um, very risky. Do I have enough information to buy the blouse? Do I even know what it's talking about? No. So risky, I would not recommend at all. So with that example, I think that it shows that understanding the piece model of a minimal versus a optimal versus an ideal can really help us find accessibility piece so that we can understand measuring for compliance can be at that minimal. And before we start arguing about interpretations, Find out where someone wants to be on that scale. Don't just assume that because you're in the mood today to go for an optimal solution that the person that you're talking to has also chosen that level. So with that said, how do we get to accessibility for good? What are your questions? Laura, do you have any questions that have been lined up for me? Not quite yet. So if you have any questions at this time, we I know we've been answering some on the fly, but if you do, go ahead and type those into uh, the chat or the Q&A box. Okay, here's one. Um, I know it was just an example, but KK-2L17 could be useful if you had to call a representative about a product. So I don't know if you want to respond to that type of yeah. comment. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, Glenn, um, I agree that KK2L17 could be useful as an additional piece of information, but I don't think by itself. And so, in that risky example, the only alt text for the image being KK2L17 would, I think, not be enough, but it in conjunction with a uh, 
floral print uh, um, cold shoulder top would be enough. Correct. Yep. Yep. You and I are, are on the same page. Absolutely. So let me ask you guys a question. Um, anybody feeling uncomfortable about the WCAG 2.0, there is no correct interpretation, um, and that it's okay to have different viewpoints for interpretation. Can, can you map yourself into one of those categories? I find in this role at DeQ, where I am a lead, the lead accessibility expert, um, I often refer to myself as Yoda of our Accessibility Jedi Council, um, that many times I have to step into the minimal viewpoint. Because if I have a client that comes to me and they're not ready to go to optimized, that I have to respect that and I can't force optimized on them. Um, and my philosophy, the reason why I can do that is that I believe helping someone honestly get to minimal compliance gives me lots of opportunities to inspire them to want to go further. And I rather they choose to move up that level instead of being tricked into it. So Donna replied, um, this makes her really happy as, as um, they often go head to head with other testers and developers. That's a reaction we have there. Awesome. So I see that someone's asked if criteria are testable, then doesn't that remove a lot of the individual interpretation? You know, I think that's an excellent question, but if you look at the individual SC, some of them are more black and white testable, but with a thing like alt text, um, the serving equivalent purpose, it is objectively testable, but it's not as black and white. So there, there are areas where um, it, is, it is a bit of a challenge, but I believe that with the accessibility interpretation model that I have on screen right now, that accessibility experts can reach consensus. Um, and also, if you're standing in a court of law defending it to a judge, that judge is going to go, yep, that's reasonable. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's an interesting conundrum, not just a one plus one equals two. We have a comment from Tim here. He says, um, I think that it comes down to one or very small committee having a set standard for interpretation. If there's no evangelist, um, present in the organization, they struggle for the best experience for their users. And, and I agree. I agree, Tim. Um, one of the things that I've found is that you have to look at the business model and a client is at risk when they're not meeting minimum. They are at huge risk when they're not meeting minimum compliance. Um, and then every step above that, when we get to the optimal, um, and I'm not even sure on that middle word, cause I'm, I'm so worried that when I say minimal, yeah, we get it. When I say ideal, we get it. But that center section is actually smart forward thinking accessibility. It's not just, oh, optimized like perfection. It's making sure that every bit of energy that you used, it leads to better design for all. I'm, I'm in that universal design mode uh, when, I, when I get there. Um, and, and we have to realize that companies don't have endless budgets. And so we have to unlock the door. We have to get those minimal doors unlocked. So someone asks here, Glenda, um, they were told three things to start with um, in accessibility are color usage, page structure, and tab order. Mm -hmm. Are these higher priorities? Um, are these higher priorities than other things? What would you list as other top priorities for accessibility? Um, it, it, those are great questions. And let me say it was color and tab order. And what was the third one? Page structure. Page structure, okay. So what I think is 
that we've been doing some research and seeing where the majority of issues lie. And I think when you go to a top three list or a top 10 list, um, that you're not going to cover it all. Um, and I would hesitate to say that one of these is more or less important than another because the color page structure and tab order, color is very important for low vision, color is not important for blind. The page structure, very important for people using a screen reader but may not have as much of a positive impact. So there's different disability types. And then we'd have to look at the different situations. So I don't think there is like, if you handle these top three or these top 10, you're going to be, you're going to be in the clear. I think we have to go all, all the way. And on the, on the tab order, I suspect that the tab order is something that's simple to do because we can tab, 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 and we also tend to be checking keyboard out at the same time. When I chose my first three things, I was choosing them for simplicity of a person that hasn't done this before, being able to do something productive. Great, thank you. Um, another question here for you. Elise asks, can you summarize what uh, you consider to be the most important additions to WCAG 2.1? Oh, that's a fun one. Um, so when I look at what happened in WCAG 2.1, the reason that 2.1 came up in the first place is that there were known gaps um, that had been there. It, it, some of those gaps had been there before 2008, so before 2.0 was published. So if I think about it, for the length of us knowing something that needed to be fixed and not getting it in, I have to say and the number of things that go in for people with low vision. Um, and that includes color con contrast for things that are not text, um, as well as making sure that a person doesn't have to um, move the page, scroll the page horizontally left, right to read content. Um, those two were, critical for people with low vision and the number of people with low vision is huge. Now, as soon as I say that, you know, there's this other part of me that's going, but Glenda, what about all the things for mobile? When WCAG 2.0 was written, mobile was still nowhere near what it is today, especially in accessibility terms. And so uh, a, a, the largest number of SC in WCAG 2.1, A and AA are related to mobile accessibility. So I, I have to say it, it, it's a tie uh, between those two things um, because can you imagine um, being told, well, it's accessible on the desktop, so wherever you are, just put your phone down and go walk over to the desktop to use it. <laughs> Uh, we also have some uh, articles that explain what kind of 2.1 in layman's terms. Uh, Laura, maybe you can add that as a, a, an extra link uh, when you send out the recording. Great, will do. Um, so we have another question here. Someone asks, how can we define with our clients the interpretation of the results? Some of them need metrics, and in their perspective, it's very difficult to measure in exact numbers when it comes to accessibility. What advice would you give to this person? So when it comes to explaining to clients, um, one of the things that I look at as an important piece is we don't want to count how many people with this disability are currently using our site because it literally only takes one person with that type of disability um, to end up in a legal complaint um, or a, an informal complaint that turns into a legal complaint because it wasn't hand handled properly. So whatever you do, don't base it on the number of people you know <laughs> with that disability. More important for me, I think, is the impact that it would have on any user if that particular feature didn't work for them. So take it out of the accessibility zone and say, okay, so what if we didn't have that feature for you? 
um, and and let's imagine we were in a in a retail situation and trying to make a purchase, and uh, you couldn't um, uh, apply a coupon. So now you don't get that. How frustrated are you? So thinking about it from the impact of uh, an actual human being, um, and then making it personal. Great, thanks, Glenda. Um, so we have a question, like what, what, do, what would you recommend for people to do if their client doesn't have an idea of their target level, um, except for having a generic understanding of what KA and AA, what would you rec recommend for them to do as a first step? Um, I would absolutely tell them that their target level should be um, in the United States or um, anywhere outside of Europe more likely I should say, um, get to WCAG 2.0 A double A now, set that as your standard and create a roadmap to get there with instantly adding WCAG 2.1 as, as soon as you get to 2.0. So you've created that as your plan. And then I would back away from that and say, if we can just shoot directly for WCAG 2.1 now, do it. So think about the cost from a business. Is it reasonable to do 2.0 first and then make another swing by for 2.1 or will that actually be more costly? Um, so we'd have to look at where they were in, in their cycle. Um, and when it comes to which pieces of WCAG 2.0 to do first, I've seen Canada, um, they're so polite. Canada, um, when they were putting it in as a requirement in Ontario, set WCAG 2.0A first, and then like seven years later brought in double A. Um, I would say once you bit off A, um, roll double A in there at the same time for WCAG 2.0. So in Europe, I would say without a doubt 2.1 is, is where you should move immediately. Um, I hope that answers your question. That's a great answer. Thanks, Glenda. Uh, another great question here. So earlier you were talking about ACTS as an easy first step mm -hmm. um, with 38 success criteria in AA. Can you comment on how many of those 38 can be um, caught by such a tool like ACTS versus needing a human to do manual testing? Right. And this is where um, I'm going to give you some different perspectives on how we answer that from, and, and I'm coming at you from an accessibility evangelist. Um, if I were to tell you which things can be completely automated, tested, where I'd never need a human to double check them next to nil for any tool because there's always something like, let's imagine uh, the language code. Um, it, it, the language code's there and it's a valid language code, but is it the right language for the content that's on the page? Um, you, you might need to have a human check for that. Um, so we could say from zero, and then I'm gonna go up to the 25% zone for it's going to reliably test for you something that you don't need to test manually and is gonna save you time, but there are other things around that you're gonna to have to test um, manually. So for example, it can reliably tell you that there is no alt text alternative for an image but it cannot reliably tell you if there's alt text that is appropriate for the image. That's going to take a human. Now, third fascinating perspective, if we actually look at it from how many issues can be caught in the scheme of things, it literally is over 50% of the issue occurrences that can be caught automatically versus manual. So it all depends on your perspective. And I will say one more thing. Um, our CTO, Dylan Barrel, and our CEO, Pretty Kumar, are audacious in wanting to improve these numbers. Um, and so we continue to do research and we have some ideas because we as an organization are not satisfied with the numbers. Um, even though this is currently very human, um, that if humans can do the best job in testing. Um, 20 years ago, I don't think I would have told you that um, I would 
get into a self-driving car, um, but I would today. So artificial intelligence, I think, holds uh, some positive hope for this to become even more automated. Great, thanks, Glenda. Really good answer on that one. So this is a really good the theoretical question. Scott asks, in, in your interpretation model, do you view optimal as referring to the user uh, experience side only, or also, or also to an organization's current capacity to implement accessibility? Um, it, it, I will tell you that that optimized um, is, there's a bit of both in there, but it's leaning more towards the user. Um, and if you're gonna, if you're gonna argue um, for I can't do it, then you really haven't reached optimized as an organization. If it's a resource issue on the organization's part, um, then that's still not optimal for the user. Got it. Thank you. Um, this is a really good question from Anna. She says she has trouble explaining to clients why they've implemented changes for accessibility and where exactly it's pointed to in a guideline. Um, in big projects, it's not always easy or obvious. So, and this, you know, generally stems from a, a clear or having a lack of an interpretation of WCAG. What would you give to her as a recommendation when it comes to um, explaining why an accessibility change was made if they don't necessarily have the best definition of WCAG uh, under their belt. Yeah, and, and what I would say is you've got to have an accessibility expert that clearly understands the difference between normative and informative um, that can tie directly back to the normative text that caused that change. And if you can't tie directly back to that normative requirement in uh, WCAG 2.0 or 2.1, then we just have to be very um, open that what you just recommended was a best practice. Um, and it, once you're in best practice land, you no longer have to tie back directly to the normative text. You can go up to a principle, you can go up to a usability study, you can go up to a lot of wonderful things. Um, and from the beginning of my career here at DeQ, um, that's been a requirement um, for our, if we're going to call something a failure, if we're going to call something non-compliant for digital accessibility, we have to list exactly what requirement it is failing. Thanks, Linda. Um, so unfortunately, we've reached the end of our time here with you all today. Um, if we didn't get to your questions, we'll get to those via email. Um, we have everybody's contact information, so we'll have Glenda or, or some of our other experts reach out. Um, but I just want to give a special thanks uh, again to Glenda for doing such a great job on today's webinar, and thank you all for joining, and we hope you join our future webinars uh, soon.